Hi, folks. I and welcome to Storytime, Storytime Live. I am Dr. Jennifer Bird. I am a biblical scholar, and I care very much about what people do with what they find in the Bible. And the reason for that is I care about people not being harmed by what is found in this collection of sacred writings. And I know a thing or two about being on the receiving end of that and of teaching that kind of thing So um, when I was an evangelist. So I care very much. I know that these are powerful texts, and I care about that for other people. That's what I'm up to here. And uh, today, let me bring on my, my colleague, my colleague and friend, friendly colleague, Lynn Huber. Hi. Yes. Yes. Thanks for being here with us, Lynn. I'm going to do a quick little, we're going to chit chat about who you are. Um, mm -hmm. So for those listening and watching later, um, glad all of you who are, who wanted to be here um, are here and able to be here. So, so Lynn Huber is also a New Testament professor, professor of mm -hmm. religious studies at Elon University. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I'm surprised. Maybe we didn't. Maybe we did talk about this before. That, right? Your undergraduate degree was in philosophy from yeah. Northwest Nazarene. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything to say about that in particular? What got you into that? You know, it isn't the typical biblical scholarly undergraduate it's, degree. It's not. Um, I started out wanting to be an art major, um, and that didn't really. Um, I don't know. It, I, they didn't have a big art program there. Okay. Um, it wasn't really, I, I don't think I got great like college counseling uh, okay. or, you know, so I went to a school wanting to be an art major, didn't have a big art program. <laughs> and um, then I, I, I just was interested in a lot of different things. And philosophy was a flexible um, minor. And there was a lot of like religion in the minor in part because oh. I went to this Christian school. Right. And so, um, so I yeah. took um, New Testament Greek when as I was an there. undergraduate. Yeah. So jealous. And, yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was, it, so that was a good start. Um, I didn't know I was going to go in this, you know, I was all over the map in terms of what I w wanted to do. And so, um, yeah, huh. so philosophy, it was a good grounding though, like, yeah. like that. So, right. I liked, and I liked my school. I had a good, I had a really good education there. Awesome. That's nice. That's always yeah. good to hear. Right. Um, yeah. And so from there, you went on to Emory and you did both a Master of Divinity. For those who don't know, that's a three-year program, very intense in terms of languages and church history and theology and biblical studies. It's a lot of really interesting stuff <laughs> was for me. Yeah. Very eye-opening. I don't know. If that was yes, it was. For you, yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into. Exactly. And yeah. it was probably good that I didn't know. Yeah. I would have not signed up. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you went on for a PhD in religion and New Testament uh, right. studies at Emory. So right. um, it has stayed. They couldn't get rid of me. It, what, so, say that again. What'd you they say? couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> I just, yeah. Hey, it's, there... a great, it's a great location too to be for seven years or however long yeah. we were there, right? I love Atlanta. Yeah. I was there for 11 years um, because I did the three years. I guess it was 11. I took all pos I took every year possible of my PhD. I think so. that's great. So that I, was, I'm, yes. I'm a little jealous again. Yeah. So, I mean, I took it because I couldn't get a job. So I, I stretched the, the program out um, and taught while I was there and did a lot of TA and went through a lot of like personal stuff. So I, like, I did say. a lot of, growing work on yourself yeah. as well yeah. as yeah the scholar the field interest yeah, yeah. well good exciting. for you i'm glad that that i guess and you speak of the the issue of getting jobs which is perhaps compounded by now i don't know you know the, the, yeah. the, we just keep cr crunching out all these phds and there aren't positions for everyone um right right we don't i mean it's text. yeah i mean it's really horrible right now i mean the job market right now is really horrible oh yeah yeah and it wasn't great then. But. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we don't need to talk about that today because <laughs> it's a whole realm of stress um, for someone like me. Anyway, so no, you you do such really interesting stuff. And I, I think I posted when I announced this on Facebook, I was like, I'm excited to bring on someone who likes Revelation. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan. 
Um, yeah. but I had it, 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 we, I've been the last two times I was doing um, looking at the the character of Satan, Hasatan, and Hebrew Bible yeah. Satan in the Newer Testament, and and that was you know I enjoyed doing that, just talking about that character. But of course, it takes us into Revelation, and it's like I was like. I have to calm myself down when I st <laughs> to look at Revelation. So, yeah, shortly we're going to get to hear some interesting things from you about it. But I wanted to share with our with the people here just a few more things about you before we do that. And so I'm I am I'm reading from your your website, the um, Elon. So you teach at Elon University, um, and right, it it highlights for us the areas that you've taught in. So you um, experience teaching the study of religion and Christian traditions. I love this current controversies in feminism. Mm -hmm. you also handle the capstone course for the Women, Genders, Gender and Studies program, mm -hmm. me, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies program, um, and I was. I was also kind of chuckling or enjoying as I read through this part, the next part of the description of the work you do, because I think about a lot of people um, who are, who were interested in kind of the, in, in thinking about biblical studies more critically, but who are lay people, right? So just the general folks end up getting a lot of um, insight from people primarily bringing historical critical right lenses and so for anyone who who wants to go look at lens um website or the elon university faculty website i listed that in the description to the video i also have her personal website um which i'll i'll bring up and just list it in the description but i love it because it reads like this very you know eclectic but very important set of lenses that you bring to doing the work you do right uh literary linguistic rhetorical, yeah. historical, and feminist critical. And I think also a form of post-colonial, um, given your interest in the imperial cult and that element, yeah. but maybe not. Um, so I just, I love that. Yeah. And that you also are interested in engaging, thinking about the gendered images, right? Mm -hmm. come from the book of Revelation. Um so I would encourage anyone who's who's interested in seeing more to go. Well, let me actually let me share your let me share a couple a couple slot, um, tabs here that I've pulled up. So first of all, the the your um, Dr. Huber Lynn, Dr. Huber's yeah. personal I know website. Lynn. Yeah. He's like, okay, I will call you yeah. Lynn. Um, I just want to make sure people know and are respecting yeah. you. But I appreciate that. Yeah. I, this, you know, this collection of books, first of all, is fun. It's a, it's a great visual, aesthetically speaking, um, yeah. given your you like artistic. cross currents cover. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. We could talk about that. We could talk yeah. about the, fa yeah, let's do. <laughs> the big red phallus. That is fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a Keith Haring image. And I have a, I co-edited, that's a volume I oh, co-edited with a colleague of mine um, named Tom Mould, who's, oh. um, who's a folklorist. And um, I wrote a piece on Keith Haring and William S. Burroughs' use of the apocalypse. And that's one of the images from it. Okay. Um, and it, it was done like during the time, um, it was done in 1988. So it was kind of height of the AIDS crisis. Oh, um, nice. Keith Haring was going to he died of AIDS a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. um, but this is like sort of people worshiping like the phallus, um, which for him is associated with HIV. And you see there are like little demon sperms on the I side. was just going to say, these are yeah. sperm. Oh, demon yeah. sperm. Right. I didn't yeah. see it that way until you pointed yeah. that out. And it's like all of humanity mm. is kind of worshiping at the foot of this idol. Um, and it's like really his critique of a lot of like religion and masculinity and um, yeah. So I love Keith Haring. I love art. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A name for me to go check out. He's um, more famous for like people know him from like the radiant baby. Um, hmm. Like he did. He was a graffiti artist in the eighties and it was really popular. So okay. this is a little, uh, this is more more statement okay, to work. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. yeah no, I, it, this is a lovely collection of books for anyone who wants to read more of what you've done. Um, I believe that this revelation, the revelation commentary, wisdom commentary is the most recent. Is that true? Am I missing? <clears throat> yes, no. And then, 
the Bible, Gender and Sexuality Collect um, edited volume is also quite recent, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So the ones, yeah, they're sort of in their order. The oh. Revelation commentary came, um, just came out this fall. Um, and right. it was a project that was begun. I began with my mentor, Gail O'Day. That's right. I um, saw that. That was yeah. bittersweet, I suppose, right? That she. Yeah. So she died, died like, before right you we were beginning finished. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she contributed really to the very like imagining of the project and okay. um, to the prologue, um, but then she passed away. So, um, yeah. which was, yeah, which was you know very sad. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but for um, many reasons, I was glad to be able to finish it and mm -hmm. um, to also have her name on the cover. So, mm, yeah, my tribute to her. Nice. Although she would. Parts of it she would not like, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, interesting, actually. Okay. Um, right. So, and so, right. So then I'm just going to share these other because I pulled them up and I think it's fun to, to do this, to make sure people have seen this. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about her or there are interesting th things, um, I think you're, you're, your um, CV, so the the things you've published, I think the um, especially the articles that the li your list of contributions, scholarly contributions and publications are really kind of fun for anyone who is interested in you know these non traditional ways of thinking and talking about really important elements of scripture um, and how they have impacted our world and how people continue to draw upon them. So. Um, one other thing I wanted to share before we just start, you know, just really more hearing about you and talking about you. I wanted to share the the queer and trans religion website because I write. So Joe Marshall and I'm drawing a blank. Melissa, on Melissa. yes, Melissa, thank you, Melissa Wilcox, two colleagues, obviously, um, who have started this, and it's been a I mean, this has been a labor of love for many years getting this started, and I'm thrilled that it exists. And I think that you have had some experience with them, um, as well as taking students, having students present there, right? Yeah, so this is um, their webpage for their journal, which is just, I think the first volume is out right now. But they also have a queer and trans um, studies and religion conference in California every <coughs> February, early in February. And I've had three different students present there. Um, I, I, at, at Elon, I get to mentor a lot of students and I get to mentor students in this kind of, often who are interested in queer and trans readings of um, either religious texts, biblical texts, or like classical texts. And so I also sometimes teach in our classical studies program. And so I've had three students who had classical studies projects present here at this conference. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. And it was a really good experience for them. Um, it's, I think it's a commit, it's a sign of their commitment to like, um, not being defined by sort of narrow um, visions of our field that they allow um, that they invite papers from people who are um, are undergraduates, but yeah. also activists. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, their um, their panels often have activists as well, like people doing like um, activist work around sex work, also uh -huh. around like prison abolition. Abolition, mm -hmm. um, and so it's a really it's a great conference, and it is. Uh, it's always been hybrid so far. And okay. so you can- Because it started in the pandemic, right? Their, their conference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they started in the pandemic. And so they started with that mm -hmm. hybrid model. And that's um, for someone who's on the East Coast who can't always, you know, go to the West Coast. Yeah. Um, in February, it's worked out well. And I've been able to go and take students for the past few years. It's great. I yeah. love it. I love it. And I do, I also appreciate what you, what you, the commentary you offered there about the field of biblical studies and religious studies that it does. And I think you and I, but we understand why, but it is, there's an element of um, an elitism or something yeah. about it that, that it is nice that 
these colleagues of ours and the people they're working with, right, all kind of appreciate the various levels of interest in this kind of work and want to want to highlight right. that. And right. May there be more of it, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And break those barriers. And so much of so many of us in the field of biblical studies, I know, have gone into the field because maybe we want to change the way, you know, we yes. want to make a difference. Yes. Right. right. And um, maybe make the world a little safer for people like us or right. others. Or, and, and so I think recognizing that by being in conversation with people who are doing like either work in the parish or um, in, you know, in community settings, I think is really important and valuable. And it, I know that being in those kinds of conversations is beneficial to me. And so um, I'm glad if I can participate in them. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And also why I think the work you're doing is great um, and mm -hmm. why I'm happy to be here is because I do think like these venues where we can be in conversation with, you know, wide range of people is, is, I don't know, it's a great opportunity. I always feel like I learned something. So mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you for saying that. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I hope you'll learn something today. I'm not, you know, I wouldn't count on it today. We're, we're learning from you really today, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, I just started sharing your some of the articles um, in the chat because I love the titles. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, ex se sexually explicit rereading Revelations one hundred forty four thousand virgins as a response yeah. to Roman social discourses. Obviously, you know these titles, but yeah. Journal of I Men. Do love that name. Yeah. So, yes, and for the Journal of Men, Masculinities, and Spirituality, I love that you published there that's yeah kind of fun i think it's no longer in it i don't think it i think it was a short-lived journal oh really but, okay yeah yeah um well. what no i'm uh, you know i think oh i'm gonna derail from the from the questions i said we'd ask okay let's take a quick let's do a little bit of the back the background to lynn and then we can talk more about the work that you do because i do want to chat with you about it but it is it when I envisioned doing this, having inviting colleagues in the my you know in our fields um, to come have a conversation with me, it really was important to me to ask, and to whatever extent you're comfortable talking about it, um, you know, give us can can you share a picture of who you are, a little bit more about who you are, uh, the things that did influence you you know, growing up, whatever phase of your life that would be, what are, you know, I'm, what is it that makes you Lynn in the very particular way that you are, you know, that you embody being a biblical scholar, what, you know, the things about you that compel you to do the work you do. So mm -hmm. anything, yeah. right. You and I talked about lots of different influences in your life in our yeah. exchanges, but what is it that helps us, would help us to see those, why you do what you do? Yeah. So I think, so, and this is something we didn't talk, okay, talk it's about fine. That, that <laughs> I have talked about elsewhere. And I do like talk about this at the beginning of the commentary that like my interest in, so I grew up in an evangelical Christian context. Um, and I mean, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, but where a lot of people don't go to church um, exactly. and are not religiously affiliated. Right. But those who are. Yes. Are like, Typically pretty conservative. Yeah. And, yeah. And um, that's the kind of environment I grew up in, um, an evangelical Christian home. Um, my dad wasn't, my dad was one of these people from the Northwest who didn't grow up with any sort of religious background, but my mom did. And when they got married, you know, he kind of took that on and it was, um, you know, there was a lot of apocalyptic thinking around me um, uh -huh. in the church that I grew up in. Um, and I worked for my church. I um, led summer camps and I led, and this was in high school. So in high school, I had reached like the pinnacle I could <laughs> in, my, in my church <laughs> nomination. Um, right, right. As a woman. and Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it was a woman. And so, um, but you were yeah. very deeply involved is what you're Yeah, involved. so I was involved mm -hmm. and um, I was good at it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm good at teaching and organizing and things like that. And so this, mm -hmm. it, like, you know. It, it worked was, for you. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, I was involved with the church. And, yeah, there was this, then there was also this millennial stuff. And in 1988, it was, I was graduating from high school and going to college. And in that year, some people believed that, Jesus was going to return in September. <laughs> I love the specificity. Like, 
<laughs> yeah, it was like, it was because it like mapped onto Rosh Hashanah because okay. of the trumpet blast of okay. Revelation. Okay. And so the trumpet, so the shofar, so right. the connection, so it made sense, but it was like this week window and it just happened to be like the first week of college. And oh, wow. that I was- Were you worried? Of, yeah, like, I was. Yeah. Like you were worried that you might not actually finish college because you were going to be- Ratchet. Yeah, I was I was conflicted. I yeah. was worried on one hand that I wouldn't finish college. Um, and then the on the other hand, I was worried because I was unsure. I had lots of doubts about whether this would happen. And those doubts like w- signaled that I wasn't like a true believer. Exactly. And so then if it did happen, my doubts would mean I wouldn't potentially not right. Yes. So it's like this weird circle. Very intense, like, yeah. right? Because this is deeply personal. Yeah. And I went to a college where a lot of other people were in the same boat. Believed um, that. Yes. Yeah. So because I went to this Nazarene college and um, the rapture did not happen. <laughs> um, at least I don't think <laughs> Thank it did. Thank you for clarifying so, that point. Yep. And, um, <laughs> and then, I mean, and then I, I, it wasn't the thing that like tipped me over into really kind of questioning and doing more critical thinking about religion, but it didn't help. Um, I was already <laughs> on like this kind of, I mean, I was interested in like rock, you know, like kind of like punk music. I was interested in art. I was interested in poetry in things that were like challenging religion anyway. And this was just part of that. Right. Yep. Um, and then also kind of the gender piece, right. I was also, chafing at the idea of being um, limited by my gender. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, you know, unbeknownst to me, I also think I was like struggling with my sexuality, not struggling with my sexuality, but also like coming to, I didn't come out until I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think Mm -hmm. at that point, I, I was, you know, dealing with like not quite sure what to do with myself in terms of my sexuality Mm -hmm. and um and you know I was in a context where you didn't talk about that right Mm -hmm. so uh, and people were wondering why you weren't dating a boy right yeah yeah man Mm -hmm. yeah and then you know I did at the end of my college but Mm -hmm. I hadn't um and wasn't interested and always said oh I'm gonna marry my dog right like that that was always (laughs) a thing in fact I've got a dog here I would not marry him, but um, <laughs> that was always the thing I would just to be clear. Say. Right. We're not actually yeah. endorsing bestiality. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. No dog marriage, no. but, um, but yeah. So, I mean, I think like all of these questionings and so um, I think a lot of that is then, even though when I went and started working on a PhD in new Testament, I tried to stay away from revelation. Did you? Um, yeah, because I felt really traumatized by it. Right. Like, um, and so, um, yeah, so my big, my big secret in, um, divinity school was that when I took new Testament, I didn't read revelation. I, didn't, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to read that. Awesome. Um, I think that's a dumb book. Like I'm not going to read it. Um, and then, but then my advisor was teaching a seminar and revelation and she's like, you've got to read it or you've got to take the seminar. You've got to read the book. You've got to do this. And actually given your interests, like revelation is up your alley um, mm-hmm. because you're interested in imagery and metaphor and art and gender and these things. And so this is actually your book and mm-hmm. you just need to bite the bullet and deal with, it. Deal with your trauma and move. Yeah. Yeah, and so I did. And did she know the tra- the trauma element for you? Like, did she know that was part of what was keeping you? Yeah, yeah. So she, she wanted you yeah. to work on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so I mean, she was. Uh, I was uh, close with her, and she, I think she knew my background. She had been instrumental in my going to seminary. Hmm. Um, I okay. received a fellowship to go to some to um, Candler at Emory. Okay. okay. And she had been instrumental in the interview process. Um, so she knew gotcha. what I was coming out of. And yeah, yeah. she was also then I th- the person who, you know, chose me to do the PhD. Um, and so, huh. yeah, so she was aware of, of where I was coming from and a lot of what I was going through. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Huh. I, I, this is, this is lovely, right? I did not yeah. know this part yeah. of your story. And 
you know, reflecting on that a little bit here, uh, the thing that you were trying to maybe, I don't know, avoid, whatever, that you did avoid, yeah. you tried not to. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad that you were able to do that work for yourself because I know that the work you do is really helpful for other people. Yeah, I think um, I I'm just wrote, so I had this commentary come out, which okay. I started yes. with my um, mentor and um, here at school, we here at Elon, um, we did a panel, like a book panel on it. And, oh, nice. and yeah, and there were a couple of people who came and said nice things, because of course, <laughs> you're gonna invite people who will say nice. things. Right, right. <laughs> and, um, and in, in my comments, I do talk about it being maybe a gift to my past self. Um, uh -huh. And um, yeah, I, because like maybe if somebody had like pushed at Revelation and also like read it in ways that were maybe um, more transgressive, uh -huh. um, you know, like maybe it wouldn't have been so traumatizing, traumatizing there would or, have been a way for you yeah. to find something a way to approach it sooner yeah. or something yeah and so like in the book i do talk about like um like the image of the of the lamb is sort of a gender queer figure and talk about the sort of non-binary character of the divine and um i play a lot with the text i mean some people would probably think that i play with it but um, yeah, but thinking about gender here in the text and sort of querying it, I think might have been something that I would have resonated with when, when ah, I was there. Even before you were, yeah, I mean, even before all your pieces of yourself were kind of sorted out, you think that yeah. that because of the artistic and the yeah the non traditional so. cartoons and pe things that you were kind of yeah. interested in growing up. Yeah, definitely. Can we circle back to what you said about the, did you say gender queer or trans lamb? The lamb? Can we talk I about that? The, yeah, gender queer. I, yeah. And I can't remember what exact actual language I use. In, yes. In okay. Country because fair enough. I just, for, you know. That's okay. But what do you, what do you mean by that for, for people who are familiar with the book of Revelation already and know something about the lamb, you know, which is, yeah. I guess we should clarify for people, right? The lamb right. and the book of Revelation stands for Christ. Right. Okay. But I'm right. going to hand over to you now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the <laughs> lamb is, is like the center of the text and the text, one of the major, like the big reveal scene is, um, <laughs> And, and it is a big reveal. It's like a big gay reveal um, <laughs> where like a big drag reveal where um, John sees God on the throne and God has this scroll and it's all sealed up. And John is just devastated because he's told no one can open the scroll. Oh, but wait, the lion of Judah can open it. He's told, oh, he's relieved, right? The lion of Judah. Um, and it's this image, right, of strength and masculinity right. yes. and power. Yes. And then he turns around and sees the slaughtered lamb. Um, and it's this real, it's, it is this revelation moment. It's like this really <laughs> dramatic, like I just, and the lamb is like in the middle of the throne and standing, even though he's, you know, it's slaughtered. And it's just this queer image, right? And um, so you have this image and you know, it's both this line of Judah, this strong figure, and then this immensely weak, strangled, mangled, right, bloody, yeah, bloody um, image, which blood and all that, like signaling femininity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so and that's and the like, weakest animal, even when it is yeah. right, like a, a lamb yeah. is not <laughs> a strong yeah. representation of divine. <laughs> yeah. And so and it's a strange looking lamb, right? It's got like multiple horns and right. it's got all these eyes. And so uh -huh. it's, it's strange, which again, is just like emphasizes its kind of queerness, right? It's like yeah. this kind of this is um, not, strange yeah. out of, you know, out of out the of world. The ordinary. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then it throughout the text, right? Like it, it gets worshipped as strong and the one who's worthy, but then it also becomes the model for everyone else, and including like these hundred and forty four thousand virginal men, uh -huh. um, which are this kind of gender queer image. Mm -hmm. 
eventually the lamb then marries the bride who's made up of these 144,000 virginal men. And it's just like, it's like, it's the gayest thing ever. I say, and I say that as a, so like, it's, yeah. I can't um, wait to pull yeah. that clip. <laughs> so, it is. So I, um, you it know, is, it can, be, so can it. please just be okay with that folks. Right. Yeah. Can we just be okay with what's going on here? Yeah. And, and so, so um, to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's, that kind of reading and i know that's not the only reading right, right. that's not the only way but i think like had i thought about the text that way yeah. um like i don't know that maybe i would have thought maybe a little bit differently about gender like oh wait right. like as followers of the lamb maybe we're not called to these sort of strict gender roles uh, um that um okay. that we are you know, that I've been sort of forced into, right? Um, right? And, you know, I think, you know, like, it's just hopefully invites questions. That's kind of what I want to do and kind of invite yeah. questions about how gender works. And Revelation isn't progressive when it comes to gender. It is right. a lot of misogyny in the text. I mean, right. not a lot. <laughs> like, it's just partially drip with misogyny. Right. Um, and violence. And so right. it's not a progressive text, but it's also not a stable text in terms of how it depicts gender. It's it's open and I think open for people and Christians to read and queer people to read and to work with and think with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I was thinking back to this, what you were, you know, telling us about yourself it, it, the the artistic element of it i was trying to think through that you were because you had said it might have helped you even you know i was thinking you were in an evangelical setting right mm -hmm. could you have even heard some of this yeah in that setting i mean who knows right but yeah um, yeah but just it does it does make it very if you're willing to see it it does make it very clear that this is there is we're playing with ideas and metaphors and we're not this isn't a thing that's actually going to be real at some point right Right. Might, that might have been something you could have heard maybe at that yeah. point. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe because, mm -hmm. of, because I was really interested in like, you know, alternative music and yeah. I mean, this was the end of the eighties and, you know, and, um, and, you know, I hung out with the theater kids and the art kids and I did right. art. And so I was in worlds where people weren't necessarily conforming. Yes. To like gendered expectations. Although I, and I wasn't in a way, even mm -hmm. though I also always like, struggled with that um and so um, because of your background because, because your background background. told you you yeah. needed to conform yeah 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 so i did see i just i did catch a glance in the great. chat where great. somebody asked about if there are other queer coded things in revelation sure great and, yes. i'm um, glad you saw I, that i think there are um i think um the whole idea of revelation you know the word revelation mm -hmm. you know is a how biblical scholars translate the Greek word apocalypse, which means to lift a veil off. So the whole book is about revealing, right? Um, which is also kind of a theme in queer um, queer art and literature and thinking. Mm -hmm. Just the over the topness of it. It's like super <laughs> easy. Um, and, you know, it's, I like that. I hadn't thought of that particular yeah. piece. Yes, the connection. Yeah. Of it. And then also... Um, sort of even like the language of filth and disgust. Um, I've written so I've written a couple of conference papers. I have not published it, um, published the stuff on um, reading Revelation in relationship to like John Waters movies, where he really, if people are familiar with John Waters, he did um, the original um, Hairspray movie, but he's also more famous for things like Pink Flamingos, Polyester, and they're movies that are sometimes really gross um, and they're gay, queer, gross um, sometimes. And the sort of, in, you know, queer people have been associated with kind of disgust culturally and mm -hmm. waters and others kind of embrace, embrace it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like looking at revelation also just kind of the embrace of disgust. So that uh -huh. lamb that is kind of gnarly looking. Totally. Right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like unpleasant water. looking. 
Yeah, or strangled. The te- the Greek right is is um, unclear. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a variant that says it's strangled. Um, yeah. So so there's I think there's a lot of different queer coded things. Um, there's also um, people talk. Uh, our colleague, Sarah Emanuel, I don't know if you know, yeah, yeah. has a great book on Revelation and- um, Not familiar with it, but yeah. It, it, um, oh, I can't, I only remember the um, subtitle. It's like Roasting Revelation or- Okay, I can uh, get or Roasting it Rome. It uses okay. humor. Um, okay. Like humor and trauma. Oh, that, yes, um, right. Yeah, and, um, but she talks about how Jezebel um, is kind of a queer coded character, somebody who is named, I mean, identified in the text using sort of a woman's name, but um, is that John sort of challenging Jezebel's gender performance or is this kind of a queer character um, given, yeah, that's the book. I love that book. Yeah, um, do you? It's a great yeah cover yeah. by the way but yeah. oh this is and she's working with the thing from Afro, uh, aphrodisias yeah. right yeah it's oh a, I think she had somebody illustrate it it's is- yeah aphrodisias and then there's a little um like a stand-up comic um, uh-huh a microphone yep. yeah so she talks about humor but she has a nice reading of jezebel okay so, i like that I mean, it's a sure. nice it's a good book and it's also i think people um i think it's kind of something that um yeah that we could think about more is how like trauma how humor is also used as a response for trauma uh-huh uh-huh i do like that there are biblical scholars bringing in the trauma lens you know in terms of <clears throat> really so much of of what is written and what and contained in the the canon for christians Right, comes out of a space of trauma or a response to trauma in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. For ma- uh, many people, would s- some people suggest, and I think there's something worth considering in that. Yeah, and then therefore, how carefully we would then be handling the texts um, in day to day life, right? If right. that's right. really, what, yeah, um, we have a student right now who's looking at. She's a psychology major, but she's looking at how she wants to become. I think um, a Christian counselor. Okay. Um, or go into the counseling field in some way, maybe pastoral mm-hmm. counselor, maybe not. But um, she's interested in how Christians use biblical ideas of hell, um, and how and how that relates to trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. trauma. and so it it can be really helpful language for talking about trauma. Is that what is that what you mean? Or well, she's she's interested in how images of hell are used to traumatize. Oh, there's that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, no. yes. yeah. for uh, sure. Yeah. There, yeah. 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 And there hasn't been much done on that, right? Like Not on the sort of connections. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there's I a lot of work done on done on religious trauma. Right. But not and, specifically this particular piece. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And so she's interested in like maybe how thinking about how Christian counselors might by knowing about sort of where these images of hell come from might be able to disrupt how Mm -hmm. they um, create trauma. Like if we realize that maybe these visions are, yeah, used rhetorically to shape how early Christians behave, that maybe if we know that we might be like, oh, yeah, your trauma makes sense. <laughs> That's what these things <laughs> are supposed to do, how they've been used for centuries. And yeah, you know. and and also maybe like age appropriateness. Don't tell yeah. don't tell eight year olds about yeah. Don't read it to them at bedtime. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many people are traumatized as adults still, right? Because yeah. that was given to them so early on right. without any kind of critical framework. And, right. And yeah. so she's interested in exploring that. That's so it's nice. kind of fun to work with. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um I I'm trying to think of there are a couple other places we could go. Hey there, Aaron Colson. I'm gonna bring this show this right now. Um while in a little transition moment here. Thank you for your super chat, Aaron. Question for Dr. Huber. Okay. In what ways do you think queer coded language was influenced by the author of Revelation's status as a political prisoner? That's a good question. Um, thanks, Aaron. Um, so scholars don't necessarily agree that John was a political prisoner. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so there, <laughs> Sorry. 
You don't. Oh, oh, okay. We'll come back to that. I'll, I'll let yeah. you do your thing and then we'll come back. Yeah, not all people do. So, I mean, I think one of the things is some people have this idea that Patmos was a penal colony, um, but there's no evidence for that. Um, and um, Patmos was just a, I mean, it had a town, it had a gymnasium. It's a, <laughs> okay. it's not a penal colony. Okay. Um, and John just, you know, he says he's on Patmos because of the, you know, the word and the name he's undergoing it. tribulations, but he's never very clear about what's going on. Um, if he, if he was, you know, people were put in exile. Um, if he were, was sent in exile, um, I mean, so I think, you know, he has this sense of being an outsider. And yeah. that, I think, is where we get maybe some of the queer coding, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Is, um, maybe. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, yeah, so we don't, we don't know that he's like a prisoner. Okay. Um, yeah, he's not in a penal colony. He might have been in exile. Mm -hmm. And if he's in exile, that does mean he's probably high status uh -huh. because otherwise he would have maybe just been killed. Right. R right. Or just imprisoned instead of. Yeah. Have you and... been. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I did get to visit the island of Patmos. At one oh, point. yeah. And have you have you been there? Have I you... haven't been. Oh, you haven't yet. Oh, shoot. Because I know that you've traveled to. Yeah. I've been to Turkey, to Turkey and times. Italy. Yeah. yeah. So, so I've been in the, what is supposedly the cave that he lived in. I mean, you yeah. know, we gotta, yeah. all of, yeah. we gotta just kind of take it with a grain of salt here, but it is high up on the island. You know, you got a great view from up there. You know, yeah. so your, your comments are raising these like, well, I just, I didn't look into whether or not there was um, evidence for that. I just took people, whatever I was reading, you know? Yeah. So I appreciate this. I appreciate this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause it, the cave that he lived in, according to lore, right. Is, is mm -hmm. highly protected. It has a Greek Orthodox priest right. watching over it all the time. Yeah. And they will show you, you know, the, the, where he laid down his, you know, where he laid down and they point, he pointed out to me the, the uh, crack in the ceiling where the sound of the trumpet would have been coming down to, you know, to announce to him or whatever. You've heard about all this. You've been yeah. nodding. You're, you're yeah. familiar with all the pieces. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now I need to rethink all that. Okay. I appreciate yeah. that. No, yeah. I mean, it's like visiting the place in Rome where supposedly Paul was, was in prison in prison, for right? a couple of years. Right. You know, yeah. You know, I don't, you know, those become, I, those are interesting traditions and I never wanted to dismiss them. Um, right. I take students to Mary's house in Ephesus. Yes. I've I, been there once. Yes. Yeah. Um, which probably wasn't Mary's house. Right. But, <laughs> but the fact that um, that these become places which we attach this meaning yes. to, I think is really interesting. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, John's status is really unknown. He's really a little like cagey about it or not cagey, but he just, you know, he's like, I'm experiencing these turmoils um, hmm. and I'm here, but um you know, so uh, there's also, you know, there's so much been so much scholarship about whether there was persecution mm -hmm. during the time Revelation was written or not. Right. And, you know, I think most scholars are like, no, there wasn't sort of a widespread persecution. There was like maybe um, instances of civic unrest. Mm -hmm. So like when we see Paul in Ephesus, um, you know, around the Artemis statue mm -hmm. the silversmiths mm -hmm. and yeah. his friends get drug in front of the city council you know um you know and they face physical violence and social being socially ostracized um but there isn't widespread persecution at that time um by the imperial forces right. Right. and so um you know john anticipates that in a way um and i think that that's one of the way the text is kind of prophetic in mm -hmm. in the he's reading the signs, like things are tense and um, yeah. And he foresees like in many ways that there's only going to be bloodshed down the road. Um, so hmm, That's really interesting. Yeah. 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 But, and then of course, I guess my question then reading, th you know, thinking about it th in this way, why such animosity towards Rome like why de literally demonize you know doesn't that doesn't that normally come from having had 
experiences beyond something like exile. I mean, exile is doesn't seem to me to be enough to justify the utter just grotesque and anger and violence and, you know, destruction. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it should. Yeah. I mean, I just, so I think, um, you know, like I look at like the work of juvenile and other like satirists who are critiquing Rome and Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily violent, but it is like, you know, depict, not depicting like Roman women in ways that are vile. And um, I think, I, I think like the the sort of standards are not, I don't know. I don't think it's out. I, I don't think it, it needs to be attached to um, persecution in okay. a way. Yeah. Um, and I think so, but like 70 was just, you know, if we think about revelation as being written post 70, mm-hmm. so post for those who might not know 70 is the year of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple there had just been a major revolt in Judea against Rome. Tens of thousands of people have been slaughtered and taken into slavery. Um, By their own government. <laughs> yeah. So I think like, you know, he's Jewish. So John is Jewish, even if he's not necessarily from the, Gal- you know, Galilee, Judea area. <laughs> um, he's still you know, connected to Jewish community, um, you know, that has got to be also in his mind. Right. So, um, and uh, that's what I think like um, Emmanuel talks about that trauma is influencing revelation. I got, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple other Mm -hmm. scholars, I mean, so uh, there's another scholar, John Marshall, who wrote a number of years ago about this, um, that that trauma of what had happened in in Judea is part of it. Yep. Um, that makes, that does make helps, you know, that helps me yeah. at least to see it, fills, it that way. Mm-hmm. It fills out maybe some of mm-hmm. the gap. I, yeah. And I just think, you know, I also like, if we look at today, like how sometimes people villainize other people in ways For and sure. the, the, the rhetoric we see by people who are just not oppressed towards right. others, That's you know, point. people can be horrible. So, um, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and choose that kind of rhetoric consciously or not to make yeah. these grand points and yeah. without like, perhaps, yeah, with, <laughs> without yeah. any sort of ethical or moral grounding in terms yeah. of, you know, the, the fallout. Um, yeah. Of such things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I, th- I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit more. Um, we'll, we will take some questions in a f- well, I'm looking at the time. I'll take some more questions in a minute, but I think it might be nice to chat a little bit if you're up for it about some of the the other scholars that you have said were mm. influential for you or were helpful. I, I should say. I don't know. You. Uh, oh, impact, I love that book. And of influence. Yeah, I thought this would be a fun one to. I haven't read it. Um, I'm. I think I'm friends with Steve Friesen. You know, like on Facebook, and I've seen mm-hmm. him at conferences. I've not read. I don't think any of his work. So, and I do love, I did, I was exposed to Imperial cults through uh, a different means. So it was through Price book, the book by mm-hmm. SR Price. So talk to us. What's, what are we looking at? What's, what do you love about this book? Um, so, yeah. So I, Steve Friesen is an, he's a wonderful scholar mm-hmm. and human. Um, mm-hmm. I will say that. And um he, I was just had the uh, privilege of writing something for a fest shrift for him, which oh, okay. is a for those who aren't familiar with that term Thank is you. like a book that sort of celebrates a person, um, usually at the end of their career. And this was on his retirement. Um, but, and it celebrates uh, their their scholarship and and often engages their scholarship as a way of tribute back to them, which is just yeah. so beautiful. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, so too, and it's, so. Um, yeah, so I had the opportunity to write something for his Feshrift, which I will say it was wonderful because often when you have a scholar who is maybe, um, you know, a white male scholar, often you'll see that the people in their wake are often often fit that, <laughs> that demographic. Yes. But this is the most diverse, interesting group of people 
Um, it makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, in terms of yeah, just where everybody was, um, because mm -hmm. this, is mm -hmm. a good, this person has really um, um, like reached out to a lot of different people. I was going to say his scholarship is thoughtful in ways that it, it, yeah get beyond yeah. those typical yeah, blunders. And, yeah, and this book engages. So this is probably um, I mean it's it's probably a geeky love of mine, but it talks a lot about the ancient. Um, um, cult of the emperor. So emperor worship in Asia Minor, and he focuses on like Ephesus and Pergamum. So cities in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, yeah. where people worship emperors. And he looks at, um, he does, um, he looks at archaeological evidence um, for the imperial cults and sort of places them within um, their context. Um, and, um, and and reads Revelation in relationship to them. Okay. So it's just a nice, like, I like that he, I like the sort of bringing together attention to material culture and mm -hmm. the archaeology of these spaces with also theoretical thinking. Mm -hmm. So he talks a lot about how, um, you know, John is sort of world building um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in response to this. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, um, I don't know, I think, I think it's a good book. I like it a lot. Uh, great. I And I love, those are two of my favorite places to visit, or Pergamum and yeah, Ephesus, for this too. precise reason. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how accessible, like, just out of curiosity, since I haven't seen it, it, is he writing for other academics? Is he writing for? Yeah. He is? Okay. Yeah, it's mostly for that's other academics. Said, okay, so, that's why you said it's a geeky love. Yeah. Yeah, it's a geeky love of mine. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's... Um, yeah, but it's not so like somebody who was maybe in, who was really interested. I think, mm -hmm. um, um, again, like if you're interested in archaeology too, yeah, it would yeah. be something to pick up um, or look at. Yeah, that's I, I appreciate that. And you know, I, there are all types who are here. Like Farsight is here today. I just saw in the comments who is um, graduate student in religious studies. I think oh. um, if I remember correctly. So all kinds of people come to you know hang out here. Yeah. So you just never know, which is part of the why I like to ask about it. Um, I am a big fan of Tina Pippin's work. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And I have only I haven't read this one of hers, but I am. Oh, you have it right there. I was trying to pull it up. Oh, there we go. That works. Yeah. Death and desire. Is, do I yeah. have a mm -hmm. the rhetoric of gender in the apocalypse of John? I think we would be it would be improper if we did not talk about gender in the apocalypse of John just a little bit with mm -hmm. you here. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure the question to pose to you about it, but maybe talking maybe this is the way to get into it. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I do like Tina Pippin's work. Um, and this death and desire is like a classic um, in my field, and it is, I think, accessible. Um, okay, to, great. To folks. Yeah. Um, this is a reprint, the one that you're showing, because uh, um, okay. it's hard to get the one, the other one. But it's a good. They've reprinted it because it's an important book, and it's a good book. Okay. Um, but she offers a real feminist kind of Marxist reading of Revelation, and she really focuses on gendered images. And when she in images that are gendered as female or in using feminine gender. Mm -hmm. um, so she's looking at the image of the bride and of Babylon, who's imaged as a sex worker. Um, mm -hmm. And she's looking at how those images get used. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So her work is really influential. Hers and Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, mm -hmm. who I know is important to you. Um, mm -hmm. um, another sort of feminist scholar in revelation I and then, yeah. yes i was just going to pull that one up also since, yeah yeah since you were just yeah thank you i i am a fan of hers i i wasn't sure which version because i think she's done a couple commentaries on yeah you know there's a series concilium series maybe or something is this the yeah. one that you were thinking of the one that i uh, i i like that book a lot it's mm -hmm. not um, it's not the one. I've got one here on my phone. Great. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, Elizabeth, for while you're doing that, Elizabeth Schuster. Like like pages. That are... is the one. Okay. <laughs> it's like, it's like. It's they like must make a glue cards. for that. <laughs> it's my Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza playing card set. Yes, it yeah. is. <laughs> um, 
I have to go through every once in a while and like make sure the pages are in the correct in the order. right order. Yes, yes. But, uh, um, just just a quick little like for those watching. Um, Yes, Elizabeth Schuster-Ferenza was the one who helped me find my own voice as a biblical scholar. I, her work is, for me, was crucial. And so I, and she has just, she's quite prolific. She has written a great deal. So anyway, yeah. yes, uh, I also don't agree with some of her take on Revelation, but that's okay too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. fair. Yeah, I like both of them. Like, I mean, yeah, I, um, so they're often, they're often put together. And there's mm -hmm. another scholar named Chanel Smith. Um, oh yeah, Rel uh, more who, recent, right? She's, yeah, more yeah. recent. Um, Chanel, Chanel Smith is also a dissertation consultant. She yes, she did. She's a coach. Yes, now. Um, I've seen that. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, but she um, she talks about how these two scholars are often put, you know, head to head. Mm -hmm. Like one is like, okay, Revelation is misogynist, and Elizabeth Fiorenza is just like, no, this image, this is not really about gender, it's about, you know, empire. And so the two of them are just always yes. imagined as going head to head. And Chanel Smith is like, eh, yeah, let's not put these sort of female identified authors just always in opposition to each other. Um, and yeah, I think they're, they're interesting. Um, so they've been really influential. Mm -hmm because they've shaped a lot of feminist scholarship on revelation. And so a lot of feminist scholars will either say like, I'm kind of in the Pippin camp. <laughs> I think revelation is more, the images are misogynistic and we have to sort of critique them mm -hmm. completely. And in some places Pippin is like, yeah, revelation just needs to be cut off from the canon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenzo is like, well, this text is used often to critique imperial systems, right? Mm -hmm. So the feminine imagery and revelation of the prostitute is off of the sex worker Babylon is often used to critique Rome mm -hmm. as an imperial system that is greedy and wealthy and violent. And Schusler Fiorenza says like, I'm not giving that up, right? Kind of. Um, right. And it's, to yeah. me, it, it remains the most bizarre thing to hear, yeah. you know, like that she says that more than once, yeah. you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so I, I often like find myself in between the two because okay. I'm also like, it's really misogynistic and it's horrible imagery, but I'm also not going to give up the book of Revelation. I mean, like I, uh -huh. I do see in it value and I think it's there. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's part of the cultural it's part of our culture. And so it has to still be engaged. Um, so you're so, not going to cut it off the way. Tina yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, because I mean, you can't like in right. many ways. And, right. Right. and also I look at a lot of, I'm interested in queer and art and a lot of queer artists do use revelation to think with. Okay. Um, and they use some of this imagery um, in ways, again, often for critique. Um, yeah. So yeah. I'm interested in that, but, I, one of the things that I'm like trying to start pushing at is like saying that, you know, gender isn't just about female identified characters. Right. right? And so I'm really interested in thinking about gender throughout the book of Revelation mm -hmm. um, and not just coding it in relationship to like the bride or the prostitutes. The My first book had to do with the bride. And mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, so like bride. I think it was the and but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, like a bride adorned. Yeah, oh, that's right. I'm like a bride adorned. Um, yeah. Let me just very quickly. If if you all have any questions, because there's a delay, you know, um, it would be really lovely if you all would start posting those because I didn't see any as as you all as we went through this hour. So if you have questions for Lynn, that'd be great. Um, but I wanted to circle back to you with this. Um. Oh, shoot. I lost my train of thought or train of th what you were talking about. Um, so you, oh, yes. So, right. You're um, the, right. Gender is not just about the sex worker, which people, I don't want to assume that people know what we're referring to there, but it's, it's uh, this, it's chapter 17 through 19 are just, for me, they're just horrible. Yeah. I just, I can't get past it being awful, but I understand, I do understand that people want to, are able to pull back from it and not be offended by it deeply <laughs> the way yeah. I am every time. Um, 
so there's the the city of Rome is being called a sex worker, and there's so if you're interested in reading it, that's that's the piece yeah. that we're referring to here. There's also this issue of the bride, who is the bride that that the lamb marries at the end. But I'm I didn't get a chance to read your article yet. Thank you for sharing it with me. Okay. But is would you say a little bit more about that though? The piece on um, masculinities. Um, oh yeah, in chapters two and three of Revelation. So. Yeah. For those watching, those are the two, those are the two chapters that there are pronouncements made to the seven churches in Asia. Not the only seven, but there are seven, yeah. and it's a lovely number to work with. So, yeah. I'm I'm curious what you have put out there, yeah. what you've said about masculinities there. Yeah. So I think um, in so yeah. So I'm interested in reading like gender outside of just these feminized images, and in. Revelation two through three, we see these letters being sent. They're being voiced by um, a ri the risen Christ, and Christ is giving people like progress reports, like okay, <laughs> people like you're really hard workers, right? And you all are real slackers, right? <laughs> I've and seen like, what you've done. Yeah, and like, and it's always like, I know your works. Like yeah. I, it's, it's like a parent coming in. I know what you're doing in there. Right. Yes. And it's about control. So yeah. like you have this kind of controlling figure of Christ and then like talking about these congregations and at the end of these congregations, um, there are, oh, yeah, I, I never know how those I things don't. work. Um, at the end of every conversation, there's like uh, a promise of a prize right okay okay and it's the prize is offered to the victor and the language in revelation it's always even though the english translation says like to the victors in pergamum oh. in in greek it's just to the victor in pergamum uh. nike right uh -huh. yeah um so yeah. nike like yes. it's the word for victor and it's often used in athletic um context Spaces. yes and if you been for people who go to turkey like if you do go to turkey like on a cruise or whatever and you go to like ancient sites you'll see like the big thing in turkey are these bath gymnasium complexes and the gymna and there's all these monuments with crowns and palm fronds and stuff like about sort of athletic culture and at the athletic culture in that time period was all about like you know, making good masculine citizens. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about how I think that one of the things going on in these, it's echoing and it's not the only discourse it's, or kind of conversation it's echoing, but it's kind of like drawing on um, this bath gymnasium athletic conversation. Um, and so saying, hey, you slackers. I mean, and it's like, you know, be real men. Right, right. right. Um, Step up and, like a real man. Yeah, like you need, so like when uh -huh. in, in Laodicea, there's this reference to like, don't be, don't be cool, you know, don't be lukewarm. Right. And if you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, yeah. which is just like disgusting. It's so, um, it's so rude. I love it. I love it because I like it? disgusting stuff. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. So like Christ says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. Like you, you're neither hot nor cold. It's it's kind of like you're you're meh. Uh huh. Right? Totally. And, yes. And in the ancient world, that sort of menness is often associated with gender, right? It's like uh -huh. not really being a man. Uh -huh. You're not hard. You're not, you know, <laughs> hot. You uh -huh. are, you know, like literally, like you are. Yeah. And so I read Revelations letters like in terms of like this kind of discourse of masculinity and I connect it specifically to like athletics. I like you can, I think read it. I mean, I think there's lots of things going on in those. Sure. I don't, it's just about athleticism. Right. But that, that later, helped. yeah. No, and then later I... the victor will be described as this lamb who like, so that's the irony, right? It's like uh -huh. at the beginning, it's all like, you know, butch up. <laughs> and then, then we find that the victor is like not so butch mm -hmm. and actually you butch guys are supposed to be virgins <laughs> so, who are like being like teen girls on the way to be, get married <laughs> literally so yes, yes. Um, it's so like it's, the one time we have this 
any sort of focus on males and as virgins, right? It's the right. only time in the entire Christian Bible where anyone gives right. a less ass about. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the thing about the that article that I wrote, sexually explicit, is that most like male commentators, when they look at that in the the literature, they're like, "Oh, it's metaphorical virginity. <laughs> oh, it's not literal." And and clearly, John does not just mean men. John means. Oh my like, gosh. Yeah. Like, For real. It's, hilarious it's funny yeah. no i yeah i love stephen moore's take on that on that yeah. section instead that's, yeah that's how i that's how yeah I that. but yes that yeah. of course right these hetero males can't yeah yes okay well we i did see a couple questions um am yeah. i interrupting your flow of thought here to no i just looked at the comments i saw aaron saying butch is a lamb it's totally true i love it i want that on a t-shirt butch is a lamb <laughs> Yeah, uh, I will probably. I didn't see that. Oh, April has a question that. about yes. sex workers being greedy, wealthy, and violent. That was the um, that was the stereotype, um, right? And so John is working with that stereotype. Um, they were, um, yeah, they were understood not necessarily violent. I think right. I was going to um, say, yeah. but but greedy and dirty. Mm -hmm. um, and women were in general in the Roman world, there's a lot of um, invective against, or like sort of misogyny against women in general as being like greedy and violent and just promiscuous. Like there's, yeah, there's so much misogyny in the Roman world. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so the depiction of Babylon as a, as a sex worker, um, echoes that mm -hmm. and draws on that. Mm -hmm. So I think so too. This is far yeah. sight. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm just going to read. Yeah. In, in my yeah. opinion, prostitution in this context is used often used as a code word for denigrating any yeah. feminine involvement in the divine female priests, divinities, etc. cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we see that in revelation explicitly. So there'll be reference to like the, uh, to Babylon um, and, um, yeah, the, there'll be references to sort of like sorcery and things like that. And it it does have the sense of, um, I think a lot of it has to do with the imagery also suggests, I don't know how to say this, um, like uh, illusion or presenting, like not being, being fake maybe. So I think in the Roman world, like, people who were sex workers were often categorized with actors and gladiators as people who were dishonorable. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so like all of those people are in the category of the infame or like the, the infamous, I guess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and lack honor. And the thing that they kind of share is that um, they sometimes present themselves in ways that are not true or mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of assumption. Mm -hmm. So there's this, connection between yeah sex work and um and dishonesty mm -hmm. and like trying to take advantage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course it's double-sided right i'm because, just gonna say yeah. and the irony here is <laughs> yeah and the irony is is that men were often encouraged to visit right sex and workers and female, they said, male, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're, if this is how you're trying to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it was legal during the Roman empire. It was not, huh. um, it was not considered shameful. There's a great huh. book by a okay. scholar named Thomas McGinn about how, you know, brothels and sex work was not, you know, there weren't red light districts. Right. If right. people have visited Pompeii in Italy, you uh -huh. know that the one purpose built brothel there is it's right in a neighborhood and it's happening at baths too. And it's mm -hmm. everywhere. Huh. And that is fascinating. Do you know about if that's the case with, you know, in Ephesus, there's that one little pot the tile yeah. that's like that suggests that there's a sex worker in, you know, yeah. in the house up ahead. But then someone else has said, yeah, but it wouldn't be like right in the main part of town across from the library. It would maybe, be. It, maybe it would have been, right? Yeah. 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 Chances are. I mean, so yeah, at, at least according to the scholar McGinn, who's okay. like looked at sort of the Mediterranean, is that yeah. like, and most sex work probably wasn't in purpose built spaces. It would have been in like Tavernae. So, like, you know, your pub uh -huh. or yeah. 
you know, your hotels or, you know, your hostels. So, mm -hmm. um, and pubs in particular to Verne were really associated with sex work. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, you're just walking down the street and there, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a yeah. two purpose building right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, I think we will take maybe one or two. I feel like I need to let you go. We are um, 10 minutes past the hour. I think this is, Oh, I, I see a question about the bridegroom and bride as master servant. I did too. Yes. Yes. I think yeah. that there's one other piece of this though with, um, yeah. What is the significance of the whore of Babylon and what are the meaning and origin of that imagery? I think especially that second part would be really helpful just for those who aren't familiar. Right. So, yeah. So April, that's a, that's a great question. And I, so like a lot of this imagery comes out is John's also evoking of, of Hebrew Bible traditions. So we see in Ezekiel in particular, um, sort of the people like Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem being envisioned as a sex worker um, and as a sort of, un and also an unfaith, both a sex worker and an unfaithful wife of God. Um, like God's wife becomes unfaithful and just, you know, and God it, gets to call uh, her a whore over and over because he's yeah, God. Yeah. So you see that in Ezekiel, you see references to it in Hosea. It's, it's, it's very typical. And so John is drawing off of those traditions, um, but like sort of in flushing them even more mm -hmm. um, and then applying it to, um, to Rome. Um, I will say there's also, there's interesting, again, Juvenal in a sec, sixth that satire and Juvenal is a Roman author. He has this really interesting um, depiction of the Empress Messalina, um, which is kind of a critique of Rome, but it's also a critique of her as a human. And it's also, it's very similar to some of Revelation's uh, uh, depiction of the great prostitute. Messalina is depicted as leaving the imperial palace um in the middle of the night to go down and prostitute herself oh, huh. and then she has like gilded nipples like, <laughs> those, like, those kind of, like tassels yeah it's kind of like a little party trick right yeah. like, she has gold uh, golden nipples um and um yeah so um interesting stuff good stuff yeah good yeah. stuff we did have this one other yeah. Okay. Yeah. As well. yeah. Do you see the bridegroom bride as a master servant relationship? Oh, I didn't even read the question until. <laughs> yeah. Jackie, yeah, that's such a good question. Um, in part because so revelation uses the language of enslavement throughout as an ideal. And I actually just in that fest shrift for Steve Friesen wrote a piece about revelations enslavement language. Oh, wow. Um, because people don't often talk about it. Mm. Um, <laughs> revelation will people in English, it's often translated as servant, but it's really slave. Of course. And Revelation uses slave in, enslavement imagery throughout to describe being faithful. Um, so people are essentially branded with God in the Lamb's name. And um, the 144,000 virgins are virgins and slaves at the same time. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so there is a kind of there is kind of a master slave relationship going on and not just in, so, I mean, so what, of course, as somebody who reads things queerly, my, my inkling is to go to BDSM, uh -huh. but also um, I think um, it, we have it where, but it's kind of a flipped relationship. So the bride or no, it's not flipped. Yeah. So the bridegroom is, is the lamb who is the master. And yeah, you do have sort of the enslaved as the, the bride. Um, I thought it was flipped for a second, but it's not. Um, so yeah, it's definitely doing that. And, um, and yeah, so it, it's, it's interesting and it would be interesting to think about sort of a queer interpretation of that, um, imagery. Um, yeah. 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 Well, in particular, especially because it is a male, a collective of males that are yeah. the bride. Right. right. And yeah. uh, to this male. Yeah. Christ. There's so much. Yeah. There's so much. So much. Yeah. This yeah. gender queer kind of Christ. Right. Like right. So the, the, the 
bridegroom is a yes. sort of gender queer figure, at least that's how I read it. And yeah, it's also an animal. Like, right. It's odd. It is. It is. I agree. Yeah. Um, Lynn, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. It's been really yeah, fun, fun to pick your brain a little bit and hear uh, some of what you've been working on. Um, hear some of the way you read the book of Revelation in ways that I imagine the people watching this, either here with us now or watching later, will very much enjoy. So I thank you for sharing your wisdom and your scholarship with us today. It's yeah, been this is fun. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And Thank you for to all of you who are here, who wanted to be here and were able to be. The, thank you if you're watching this later. And I appreciate all the ways that you show me that uh, you like the work that I'm trying to do here, the work I'm doing, and the work I'm trying to make happen by bringing people on, all those kinds of things. I would love it if you've enjoyed this video, if you would like it, and if you haven't subscribed already, if you do that. And I say that because it helps others like you to find the work I'm doing. It's kind of a win-win. You know, um, thank you. Thanks for being here. And next week, it's back to talking about spiritualized readings of the parables versus more socioeconomic and more grounded ways of reading. I think that's what we're up to next, right? Um, thanks for being here. I'll see you next week. <laughs>